You are listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. There we go. For those of you that don't know, uh, this is Josh Motlong. Um, I, I, I don't quite know how long Josh and I have known each other now. It's it feels like decades in one way and not that long in another, but uh, Josh has become a good friend, and uh, I've been able to minister alongside of him recently, and he absolutely is a gifted friend, and I'm really looking forward to what he has on his heart, and uh, so just buckle in and give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Justin. Father's Day is, first of all, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. I love it here, and um, I'm going to talk about the Father's heart some, but what I really want is for us to have an encounter with the Father, because we need it. We all need it in so many ways, and Him loving us is what empowers us to love. I know the first commandment is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that and we would love others. But we can't do any of that if we don't receive his love. Okay, <laughs> already crying. <laughs> All right, so if we can, let's, let's approach this time together like a family. And I'm just going to pray and ask each of us to ask God for an encounter this morning so that regardless of what I say or what comes out of my mouth, we meet with him and we have a transformation. Can we do that? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your desires. And the words that have already been given through Justin and Andrea, that you want to come in power, you want to invite us into your living room. You want us to meet with you. And I ask that you would come in and move in our hearts and that truth would, would take root and it would change the way that we think. It would change the way that we see and that we hear. It would change the way we believe. It would change our identities to line up with what you see. God, if all that comes out of my mouth is bubbles, would you meet with us? In Jesus' name. All right. How many could use a touch from God? Yeah? How many of us could use his word changing us forever that it becomes more than words? Yeah, me for sure. Um, not exactly sure what direction we're going to go, but it's probably going to bounce around a little bit, and I don't know how long it's going to take either. <laughs> it probably won't be too long. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple things that are misunderstandings I think we have about the Father. Things that maybe we've grown up around or you read in the Bible and you kind of get hit with and wonder how that works out. And the first is that is that he's different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because sometimes you read these passages and it's hard to reconcile. (laughs) You see all this what looks like just intense wrath and rage against people. And I asked, I've asked about it several times and never really had an answer, but out of the blue a couple years ago, God said, do you want to know why it's hard to understand that I'm the same on both sides? And he said, simply, in the Old Testament, because the Spirit did not dwell within us, all the direction had to come from outside. He had to guide by 
his hand by external impetus and, and forces and movement so that we could recognize him. They didn't have the Holy Spirit speaking from the inside to guide gently with a whisper. And so, and so he, in his mercy, would make extreme measures to keep his people from running completely away from him. And he would do whatever he could do to draw his people into him. And everything was an invitation into relationship. Then we move to the New Testament. And you know, (laughs) Jesus could have saved us. He could have died on the cross and never given us the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about that? He could have made a way for us to go to heaven. But we would have been left living the same way the Israelites lived in the Old Testament needing external movement, external direction, and forces to keep us from completely losing ourselves. But he not only saved us, he gave us his spirit. It says that he put all of himself inside of us, everything that we need for life and godliness inside of us. And Jesus lived as a demonstration of what it looks like to live in the Father's love. Right? And we can move into the New Testament, and even then sometimes we find ways to create a a segmentation or or a differentiation between Jesus and the Father. One of the passages that often comes up is when Jesus says, not my will, but your will. But it's the only time that you ever see any kind of distinction where he's not in full agreement already with the Father's will. So what is he doing there? He's demonstrating what it means to live in submission. So much of what he did was showing us how do you live in the Father? How do you, how do you walk by his Spirit? How do you live fully in him? And he would even pray prayers and even say, I'm praying this so that you hear me, so that you understand the way this works. And when he said it, he was... He was not making the declaration that his will was different from the Father's. It was always the same. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Talk about him being on the cross and, you know, he could have called down tens of thousands of angels. He could have, but it was never a thought in his head. Because his love is pure, it is whole, it is fully in line with the Father's. And so he was never thinking about a what if or second guessing his love and his commitment to us. He was giving us the demonstration of what it looks like to live in the Father. The Father is good. A significant portion of what Jesus spoke about in the New Testament was the revelation of the Father. He was constantly revealing him, trying to get us to look back to what God's really like. And everything that we see in Jesus is everything we know in the Father. So, we may know these things. We may have heard them before. And oftentimes there are truths we hear and we think, God, I really want to believe this. I really want your word to penetrate my heart and for this to change me. And sometimes we're longing for the Father to touch us and we don't know how that works. And I want to just say, that he touches us often through people and through relationship. When someone loves us in a way that we don't feel worthy of love, when we feel broken or like we're lacking and someone steps in and says, no, I I love you, I adore you, I don't see you by that weakness. Sometimes we'll receive that, but we don't understand that that was the Father moving in through someone else to say, I love you. I love you so much. And I want to actually pray 
for a, uh, a recognition in our own lives of seeing the Father in people and in relationships. Because if we can begin to receive him in that way, we can begin to receive his heart in greater measure. And in that place of love, we can really give love. So if you would, just close your eyes for a second. Papa, you love us really well. And I ask that you would open our eyes and ears to see the ways that you're loving us. To see you in relationship, to see you in people, to understand that you are constantly working through things and situations and people and places. You're moving in our hearts and you're expressing your love and we want to recognize it. We need to. We need to be transformed by your love. So open our eyes, Pop. While we're on that note, I just want to say that if you're in a hard time and you're struggling with something, one of the best things you can do is reach out and ask somebody to help. I know that's obvious, but sometimes we just don't do it. Sometimes we just want to suffer alone. And we'll ask God, you know, come meet me here, meet me here, do something, do something. And he has, a, he has himself stacked up and ready to walk into your life and bring healing. But we won't reach out. But he created us to be a family. He reveals himself through his family. In James and John's letters, when they're referring to love, it's always about the family. Love each other really well. Sacrifice for each other. Invest, connect, give, pour yourself out, and the world will see that you're mine. But if we're living alone, and if we're suffering alone, we can't. We have to invite him in. We have to in- and do that through people, through relationship. And sometimes there's places when we, we, we have the faith to stand on a promise, to stand in the truth, and the lies come against us, and they're knocked down. We hold up that shield of faith. And sometimes those lies come, and they stab you, and they pierce you, and they hurt. And we get wounded, and we get broken down. And that's when someone else needs to come in and put their shield up. And that's the way it works. Sometimes we don't have the strength, and someone else does. So we let them in. We let them put the shield up, and that's okay. It's okay for as long as you need it. For those people to come around you and put their shields up and say, you're mine, I'll fight for you as long as I need to. And sometimes it's just standing there. Sometimes it's not saying anything. And sometimes it's bringing them into the truth. But in time, with that, eventually we can stand on our own again and raise that shield of faith again. And hold on to the promises and start doing it for more people. And then we, we step in and we put the shield up for others and we become a family. I feel like the, the revelation of this, of God the Father in people around us, could change us forever. It's just one small truth that could change us forever if we opened up and run with it. Isn't that like, we don't need more words? <laughs> I feel like it, probably anybody in here could preach, you know, and give some really good truth. We need the truth to go down deep. We had one scripture that we let go down deep, it would transform us. The Bible reveals Jesus, but it also reveals who we are. It opens us up. This is the other way that we encounter the Father. His Bible is a place of encounter. His word is a place of encounter. We, we fully see him opened up in love, revealed, and we discover who we are. And I'll tell you, you look just like Jesus. John said, you forget how innocent you are. This is why you struggle. You forget how much you look like him. And you may not feel that way, but it's the truth. And again, we need each other to be reminded of it. So that we can stand and say, yes, I look just like you. 
I am just like you. And all that stuff, whether it's addiction or struggle, lies, fear, you stand and you say, that has nothing to do with me. It is not me. It's not my inheritance. I don't even recognize that person anymore. Because that's what he sees. He looks at you and sees none of it. He, you forget how innocent you are. And we do. But we don't have to. We can stand in his promises together, interdependently, and, and walk in absolute transformation. We can be a kingdom of people so empowered by the love of God that every sickness, every mental problem, every addiction comes into our presence and is eliminated because the love of God invades. It's not an if thing. It's there. I guess since it is, it's if and it's like, are you going to take it? Are we going to walk into it? Are we going to be willing to risk enough and believe enough that he loves us enough that those things are for us? Your destiny is limitless. And in encountering his love, we meet a place where the safest thing in the world is to put what's in your heart in his hands because you know that he's more committed to bringing about in your life what you want than you ever could. Putting our dreams and hopes in his hands frees us to live in the moment and know that he will bring everything to pass that we need and every longing and desire of our heart. These words are good, but we need an encounter. We need his spirit to come in and take all the truth and put it down deep in us. I have a friend who runs an investment company, and he told me a story when he went to a retreat, and they were singing Good, Good Father. And he went there frustrated, and they were singing it, and he was just raging angry. Just saying you're not, you're not good. This is bullcrap. It's not who you are. And within the day, the love of God hit him so strong, he was weeping. Thank God. This is holy who you are. You're such a good father. So I actually want to take a minute and let's ask together, if God will come in and do something supernatural in our hearts, something more that I could ever give with words, something more than what we could ever learn or understand. Because you don't have to understand the kingdom to benefit from it. So let's do this together. Don't let this just be my words. Let's ask together. Many of the greatest moves of God in the last century happened from a group of people asking together. All right? God, would you come meet with us? Would you come heal our broken understanding, our broken pictures, experiences, and lies that say you're not good? God, relationships that have wounded us, Dreams that have been shattered. God, do a work deep down that says you are a perfect father and I trust you in everything because I know your love. God, bring your love into this room, into each of our hearts supernaturally I ask from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet that your presence would come and just radically, radically fill us and drive out lies, drive out fear, drive out deception, bad experiences, and that we will stand on the truth that you love us. That from before time, you planned to give yourself wholly for us. 
you held nothing back. In Jesus, we see you. And you gave us your Holy Spirit so that we could live fully alive, just like Jesus. Okay, two more quick points. One of the other things that really makes it hard to receive God's love is sin. Now, don't get, don't get nervous. Because <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't condemnation. The problem with sin, and I, and I, yes, it's right and wrong, it's black and white, like it's the, the opposite of, of God. But I, th- I think that the way that we perceive we perceive it and what we think of it with him is different than the motivation behind his hatred of sin when it pertains to us. Because the problem with sin (laughs) is that it perverts the way that we see and hear and that we can't receive his love properly. His whole goal is to give us love. So when we give in to sin, nothing about him changes. The way that he loves, it didn't change. Not even one bit. The way that he reaches out and gives affection, not, not even one degree. But all of a sudden, we don't hear right. And we don't see properly. And it affects us. And we think his love is something that it's not. So the goal in sin is not, I mean, in, in living righteously, it's not to not do bad things. Yeah, they do have consequences. But the worst consequence is that it messes with the way that we receive his love. So by the grace of God, may we live rightly to know your love. It's not about just right and wrong. It's not. It's about receiving his love, which will change everything in all of our lives forever. So God, we choose to live by your grace, by your spirit that is inside of us. And when we hear you whisper, we will lean into your grace to stay in your love. So that day by day, when we look in the mirror, we think, yeah, I love you. You're perfect because what we see is Jesus. We see the way the Father looks at us. That is the goal of living in his righteousness. And the beautiful thing is that it's by his spirit. It's not by striving. It's just leaning in. It's just leaning into his grace and trusting that it's there. Yeah, this is for me. Your truth is for me. This new life is for me. That old stuff, that has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me. On that note, if you're in a place where you don't need someone to shield you, which is very real and it's, it's, a, it's a good place to be to have people around you doing that, We need to learn to stand in his truth. And what I was just doing is really the simplest way it looks. Is when the lie comes or when the fear comes, we simply say, God, I thank you that I am just, I am wholly innocent before you. Thank you that I have my eyes fixed on you. And that has nothing to do with me. And we find this in his word. You stay in his word, you want promises to hold on to? There's a million. There's a million in here. Grab one and let that be your weapon. Let it be the thing that, the, the sword of your identity, the thing that cuts down everything that says this is not who you are. You say, no, this is who I am. And stand in it. And don't let anything else tear you down from it. 
I say you, you guys know I mean me. <laughs> All right, last thing. This is just a fun story. Um, I used to compete in endurance events, and they were led by special for- former Special Forces guys. And one of the events we did was a competition between two teams, and they're about 24 hours long. And it was the end of the day. We had done a series of events, and we were tied. <laughs> and the last thing is a, uh, we got backpacks full of weight, and it's a man-to-man competition. Each team has two guys, and you hold the backpacks full extension. First guy to drop them, that team loses. You can call in your second guy when you're tired. So our team, it's my buddy Brandon. He's first, and I'm the last guy. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And the other team, they've got the two guys, and these other guys are monsters. Huge. So Brandon and the first guy are going. They last a couple minutes, which is, it was impressive. And, and while they're going, Brandon is talking so much trash, <laughs> saying, when my boy Josh comes in, y'all are dead. <laughs> <laughs> y'all are, you don't stand a chance. I bring my boy in, it's game over. Game over. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Literally, the next guy, twice as big as me. And uh, I'm thinking, not a chance. There's not a chance I'm going to beat this guy. But here's the point. That is what the father feels about you. He says, I put my boy, my girl in the game. It's game over. It's game over. Who he is, who she is, they get in the fight, you're dead. You don't stand a chance. Am I right? Say yes. Say, that's me. Say, that's me. He puts me in the game. It's game over. I want you guys to know that deep down. I want to know that deep down. I want to feel his confidence in me. And if you're curious, I did beat the other guy. (laughs) And to tell the truth, I drew on two things. What Brandon said about me, I mean that. And the other, I was picturing my children. I think I'm done. (laughs) God, again, we need you, and we are grateful for your spirit that gives us the grace to stand in your truth and to say, I am a loved son. I am a loved daughter. I am so innocent and perfect before you. The struggles I have experienced, the wounds I have faced, the emotional trauma I have gone through. It is nothing in the light of your love and the way that you see me. I am whole and adored in you. I have a perfect father in you. And I am perfectly loved. And when I ask of you, I do not get a snake instead of a fish or a stone instead of bread. When I ask of you, you overwhelmingly pour out. You do it through the people around me. You do it when I sleep, when I lay my head down. You speak to me directly. I bless all of you in the name of Jesus to understand and recognize that the Spirit is speaking to you. It's not just your imagination. The Holy Spirit is whispering His promises to you. He is telling you that He loves you. And by His grace, you may receive it. You may say, yes, thank you. Wow, you do love me that much. Unbelievable. And whether anyone else recognizes it or not, wow, yeah, you love me so much. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I think I'm done.
Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.